Good morning, elders, youth, professionals, and indigenous peoples. I bring warm greetings to the Oneida of the Thames, the Chippewa of the Thames, and the Muncie, Delaware, and I thank you for allowing us to meet in a good way in your sacred territory, and I look forward to meeting you. I have a qualifier. I'm not an expert or a researcher on family violence. What I will share with you today is a first-hand account of my life my experiences as, as an Indigenous woman, a survivor of the Indian residential school system, survivor of rape and sexual abuse, domestic abuse, and a survivor of cultural genocide and colonialism. I'm a survivor. I wish I were not. While we are enduring resilient people, it is time we begin, begin to thrive and live in peace and harmony on our traditional territories. It is my pleasure to address you all who care about domestic violence and the patterns of abuse that has reigned upon our nation since the coming of the visitors from Europe and abroad. We have 15 minutes. While it is very short, we will open our hearts and embrace each other in ways that are very important to stopping abuse and violence of all women. Indigenous women have been the center of our communities from time immemorial. We are strong, resilient people. We love our people dearly. I'm from a family of eight with six surviving members. My one brother froze to death, suffering from the impact of Indian residential school that destroyed his life. My brother Harry and I are both survivors of that system. My baby sister, Ada Elaine Brown, was born on October 11th, 1959, in Cassiar, BC, the youngest of our little tribe. She was the only one born in the hospital. The rest of us were delivered by midwives in our home. I want you to know how adorable she was and how much we spoiled her, how much we loved her. I was her caretaker and spent hours with a traditional swing. I think most of our nations had these swings where we sing to the baby, rock them to sleep. <clears throat> and I sang to her. I taught her to walk. I taught her to talk. She was the most loving little girl. I can still hear her cute little baby, baby talk. When she died, she was just another dead Indian. You know the story. It's the lifestyle. It's the bad choices, wrong place at the wrong time. Let's be frank, those still are the discriminating attitudes we faced today in our daily lives. It was not the first time she'd been to a doctor, sick, lonely, beaten, scared. Before she died, she'd been to the doctor three days in a row. She was given Tylenol 3s and sent home. She told the doctor she was beat up downtown. She was beaten many times by her partner, who preyed upon her, and if he is still alive today, is doing that to another woman. Message for the medical profession. Take your job seriously. If you don't care about the people, don't work with them. Take time to report anything suspicious. Do your job if you see someone beaten. Check for head, injury, head injuries, ask questions, call the police, call a shelter, Domestic violence kills. Take the time, you may save a life. Message to the police, too, to do your job. If you do not want to be the part of the solution, find another profession. When my oldest sister received the call that our sister was deceased, she asked, what happened to her? The response from the RCMP was that she died of natural causes. Within hours of my sister's death, somehow they knew she died of natural causes. No autopsy, no investigation at that point, and note on the file, died of natural causes. 
I asked, how does one know that she died of natural causes at the age of 41? Any death of a young person should be investi investigated, especially when she has visible bruising, lacerations, new bruises upon old bruises. When we claimed our sister's body in Whitehorse, Yukon, we could barely recognize her. My oldest sister asked me, is that her? I think there's been a mistake. Please go and find out if that is her. I did ask further questions and could recognize her enough to say, this is our sister. Last week, our baby sister would have been 58 years old. Any death of a family member is difficult, but the grief of a loved one who died in a violent death with no justice is a searing, painful grief that continues to smolder and grip your life. It never goes away because there's no closure. There's blaming, there's shaming, there's a wandering heart that will never rest. Ada Elaine Brown has two children and five grandchildren she will never know. Our hearts are broken. How do we go on? How do we forgive? How do we reconcile? To bring change is a massive process. Extensive change is required in education, justice, child welfare, policing, and the medical professions. While it is true that violence exists within Indigenous communities, we must look at perpetrators who prey on Indigenous women from outside of our communities. We are talking about male perpetrators from all races, preying upon Indigenous women with impunity. Not all cases involve intimate relationship. Told us strangers are known to attack our women and girls. Prevention is the key to the reduction of harm in family violence cases. We know that women are assaulted many times before they leave or before they are killed. Women who are abused frequent doctor's offices, hospital emergency wards, social workers, food banks, and courtrooms. Is it too far-fetched to have shelter workers in hospitals, in courtrooms, in the mall, in social welfare offices, walking the streets? We need commitment from governments, police, medical professions, and social workers to bring this necessary change. I want to give a very simple <clears throat> example of a best practice. I went to the, into the Red Deer Hospital for a minor issue, and the nurse asked me, are you in, a, in an abusive relationship? Do you fear for your safety? I said, what? <clears throat> I answered the questions. No, I'm fine. Everything's okay. I thought, I went home and asked my doctor, that, my daughter, and she said, oh, no. She said, that's the, the policy now in that hospital. Everybody gets asked that question. <clears throat> I thought, what a great practice. Why not ask every woman? After all, every woman is at the risk of male violence if you're a woman. This simple yet loaded question can save lives. I don't know what would have happened if I said, yes, I am, but I'm assuming they had a safety plan in place. Before coming here, I spoke to an elder saying, I'm going to be doing this in a uh, difficult um, task. And she, I said to her, it's about family violence. And she's, her response was simply, put it in the hands of women. Women know women, and especially women who have experienced violence. They know what to do, what to say, and how to get women to safety. Funding is essential. We heard a uh, representative from the government. The message is funding needs to get out there so we can do the job. One minute, I lost my, I lost my speech. <laughs> if we are to bring reconciliation, things have to be done differently. It cannot be the same way. I have hopes for the upcoming generations and hope they will be less tolerant of sexism, racism, 
and sexist and racist policies. Sexism and racism is pervasive and entrenched in Canadian society and will take large-scale large efforts to change this. I do see changes in attitude, more interest in truth and reconciliation, but there's a lot of talk, but not enough action. We need, need to move into the action phase. <clears throat> the broader questions are, how do we change racism, specifically against indigenous peoples? There's a specific form of racism that is directed and we reproduce from one generation to the next against indigenous people, the owners of the land. What goes through my mind when I think about what, what could have been done differently in the homicide of my sister? I wonder, would my sister still be alive if a social worker referred her, if someone referred her to counseling, if a police officer was called by the doctor, if her partner was questioned, if she was hospitalized at some point and received proper diagnosis, she died of a brain aneurysm. The impact of family violence is great. Children who witness violence will have lasting health issues. Children will suffer mentally, emotionally, physically, and have a difficult time to be successful and well-adjusted as adults and provide healthy parenting. PTSD exists widely among our people, resulting from the residential school system and the foster care system. This area is not well known or well treated, along with depression. It is important to look at these areas to address the high rate of suicide among our youth. While this presentation is very difficult for me, I participate because I believe together we can make changes. I have opened my heart and soul to you so that you can under, we can better understand each other. I ask that you take this gift I have given you in my story and share it with others. That is how we learn from each other, by sharing, caring, and passing on our knowledge, person to person, heart to heart. Madhu, everyone. Thank you, in my language, Madhu Masichu, for being here. Akdigadet here be with you all. Thank you. Well, first of all, let me say how honored I am to be here. It has been an awesome day. I have learned so much. And if any of our opening panel are still here, um, I'll hear your words in my head forever. And um, I cried a lot this morning. And I t told somebody today, I guess when I stop crying, that I ought to get out of the work. So we're charged with addressing safety planning for vulnerable populations. Um, and when I heard the opening this morning uh, from the elder, I didn't know much, I have to admit, about the seven fires prophecy. So of course you Google it, right? and I found out some more, um, but I'm feeling like we are probably in an era where we do have to make those choices as a global planet, as a global people. And especially for someone in the States, I feel particularly vulnerable um, to a country's government that seems um, absolutely bent and determined to do more to befoul the earth and uh, you know, make our waters full of disrespect. Um, and that it's, it's uh, my country seems to want to go down the path of more prosperity for the few. Uh, and so does our world, uh, rather than a good life for everyone. So, you know, I'm going to keep that in my head and do everything I can to change the policy in my country. Um, I'm, I like a lot of what Canada is doing now. Um, I'm always tempted to move north, except what keeps me, of course, 
in my country is these grandchildren. So all of you that have heard me talk, you know I always start out with pictures of the grandchildren. Um, and my piece here um, is to ask all of you if anybody after the presentation has any thoughts of how I get those incredibly privileged grandchildren to really deeply recognize their privilege and to recognize the biases that I know they're growing up with. You know, my daughter says, well, mom, you taught us not to be racist. But I'm like, yeah, but see, that's not good enough. You have to live it. You have to think about it every day. So if you have any tips for me, let me know. Now, what I'm supposed to do is talk about safety planning for vulnerable and marginalized populations. Um, and uh, what Myrna told me is, is the way it's defined in this homicide prevention initiative is aboriginal populations, immigrant populations, rural, remote. I would say we ought to add the LBGTQ continuum to that also. Now, I'll confess from the outset, I got nothing for you in terms of rural and remote. Um, the intimate partner femicide study was done primarily on urban populations. There's a few rural cases in there. But I am thrilled that there are so many people here that are thinking about it, and I'm looking to my colleague Donna to, to address it in this presentation. The danger assessment, which many of you know about, was developed for women. It's in order to help women recognize the danger in their relationship with an abusive man. Now, part of the danger assessment, in terms of its history, it was, I first developed it based on a small domestic violence homicide study in Dayton, Ohio, small town. And based on the work I did in that study, I realized I needed to work with abused women if I was ever going to decrease murder of women. And so I started on a journey doing that, working in um, leading support groups and shelters um, in Detroit first and then in other places in the country. And also recognizing, teaching my students, my nursing students to recognize abused women in their practice, uh, talking to a lot of abused women and realizing they oftentimes were us underestimating their risk of being killed. They would tell me the story and I'd think, oh my goodness, that sounds way too much one of the, like one of those homicide cases I reviewed. But yet, I'm more scared than she is. And that's when I learned to recognize clinically that normal minimization, put it in the back of your head kind of process that women do, abused women do. And not all of them are at high risk, but those that are oftentimes underestimate their risk. So I developed the danger assessment getting the wording for the items, and it's available on the website. It's available for free. They promise me even if I get hit by a bus tomorrow, it'll be up there for free. I've sold <laughs> my soul, not totally, but you know, the, the rights to, to Hopkins so that it will always be available. And the wording of the danger assessment came from the women. Uh, the notion of choking strangulation went on the danger assessment back in 1986 because women told me that that was one thing that scared them. That was one thing that made them think he might be capable of killing her. Um, and the original danger assessment, I've done the danger assessment myself with 2,200 women uh, that I have records of, and probably more than that. Um, so I've used it, and one of the most important parts of the, the danger assessment is the calendar. This makes it interactive. This helps her come to her own realization of the pattern of domestic violence it cuts through that normal minimization. Now, the calendar is built on the notion that she's strong, resourceful, smart, 
And like all adult learners, we learn much better, it's much more powerful if we see it for ourselves in our own situation rather than somebody telling us what to do. And this is a quote from a woman in Alberta, Canada. You actually see your own roller coaster ride. It's on the calendar. Now, the, um, it was further refined in the national U.S. domestic violence femicide study. Um, tested with ROC curve analysis, all of that's available. Um, and all of the articles related to the danger assessment are on the danger assessment website. We have also developed a version for immigrant women, DAI. Immigrant women, again, in the United States, so it hasn't been tested further, needs further development and testing. We're working on that right now. But that's also available on the danger assessment website. We also have a DAR for same-sex female couples. Um, and that we're continuing to work on also. We also have a DA-5, which is a short form for healthcare providers. It was actually um, developed mostly by a Canadian physician, uh, Carolyn Snyder, who's now in Toronto. Um, we have uh, revised and worked on that further, and we have a publication coming out on that in 2018. The DALE. Uh, was developed in collaboration with the Jeannie Geiger Crisis Center in order to um, help them identify which cases of domestic violence needed to be handled by a high-risk team. So it's calibrated slightly differently than the other danger assessments in order to do that. Um, and uh, the um, that DALE also, um, there's a publication coming out on that, but that's available on the Danger Assessment website. But that's around more around identifying cases that need heavy duty, highly collaborative risk management. Um, the, it's also in the Dove intervention, which is for pregnant women in uh, prenatal, either home visitation or prenatal care. That intervention has been tested and found to significantly reduce repeat domestic violence. That's also being used in the NFP, which is the um, uh, family partnership. It's the home visitation program. Oh, David Olds would just nurse family partnership. Got it. Um, and uh, Dana Jack and Marilyn Ford Gilbo are um, using the danger assessment in their home visitation programs um, and they're developing an intervention specifically for NFP nurses to do with domestic violence victim. The LAP is a short form of the danger assessment and note it's a lethality assessment protocol. It's not just a lethality assessment. There's a protocol that goes with it. And sometimes you hear people say, oh, well, we use the LAP. You know, we just ask these questions, and there we go. We know who's at high risk. The protocol that goes with it is that the police officer informs the woman or the survivor, and they're using it with males as well as females, um, that they are, are at high risk. According to the LAP, it's calibrated to overestimate risk. Um, and gets them in touch with domestic violence advocacy right there on the scene. Doesn't give them a phone number to call that they don't, but gets them in touch with domestic violence advocates right there on the scene. Offers them the phone, they don't have to talk, but that's the protocol part. So it's not just, you know, and you may notice, all of these are intended to connect women at high risk with domestic violence services so she can make choices what to do. I wanted to give you a little bit of data from my collaboration with the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters. Carolyn Gerard is out there somewhere. Um, and uh, this project um, we did many years ago, but we wanted to keep track of what happened when the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters decided that the danger assessment would be used in all of their shelters as women were admitted within the first 48 to 72 or 24 to 72 hours after admission. 
So domestic violence advocates were concerned about doing that with the danger assessment. They were particularly concerned about the calendar, concerned that it would re-traumatize women. So that was in part why we embarked on this research. 46% uh, of the participants in this research were Aboriginal, 31% um, English Canadian, other visible minorities, 7% and 5% foreign born. So importantly, the Alberta Council of Women's Shelters uh, wanted to modify the calendar, which anybody's free to do, anything they want to do to make it um, better for women to fill out. They wanted to add emotional abuse as well as the physical abuse, the one through five on the calendar. They wanted to add emotional abuse, financial abuse, um, sexual assault, and spiritual abuse, and how often that happened and put it on the calendar. One thing that we're doing now with all of our calendars is actually adding when um, choking or strangulation happens on the calendar. So we had 180 respondents who gave us in-depth, um, it wasn't in-depth interviews, it was they gave us open, the answer to open-ended questions about what it was like for you to complete the danger assessment and the calendar. And the thematic analysis, first of all, a lot of women said, yeah, it's hard to do. It's distressing, it's upsetting. A lot of women cried. But it was also part of a healing process. First of all, by increasing awareness, decreasing minimization. I, I love that quote about, I'm always trying to minimize my experiences. And she hadn't even been to support group yet. So <laughs> I don't know how she learned that terminology. Uh, so she already had that in her head. But then also women talking about it being a healing experience. Um, I love that uh, in terms of loosening my, bre loosen my breathing, which we know is something that we do when we do finally start to relax. Um, also increase their realization of danger. And the theme of strengthening resolve, those quotes, and those are just examples of quotes, there was many other women that said something like this, um, is what makes me feel like the danger assessment is worth doing in terms of strengthening women's resolve. So also we measured um, the outcomes, and those of you that are researchers in the room, this was lousy research. It was pre-post only. It was, you know, it's not, no control group, none of that good stuff, no follow-up over time. But just pre-post in terms of women um, marking their danger more after doing the danger assessment. Well, that makes sense. But the ready to take action significantly more. Ready to get help from the shelter personnel and ready to get help from police. So based on that work with Alberta Council of Women's Shelters, we also worked with the indigenous um, shelter directors um, and their staff in order to make the danger assessment more culturally appropriate for indigenous uh, women on the, in the on-reserve shelters. And so they came up with the DA circle design. It's part of the walking the path um, uh, project that was for children um, who were experienced, were in homes where there had been domestic violence, indigenous children. Um, so it was um, designed to be a little bit more culturally appropriate, um, using uh, culturally uh, significant symbols on the calendar, and also doing the calendar in a month process, more appropriate, I'm um, not meant, a season process, more appropriate to a medicine wheel type concept. And women, rather than the regular danger assessment calendar, women are asked to work backwards, you know, starting with yesterday, and work backwards, because we remember yesterday better than further back. But to take advantage of the more storytelling traditions, uh, women were, were told to dive into the, any season they wanted to and work backwards and forwards within that season to mark the abusive incidents um, as is done on the regular danger assessment. Now, we have not formally tested the DA circle. 
But the notion of safety planning based in part, at least, on the danger assessment is that women are aware of the level of danger in their situation, their risk of homicide. That's one piece of information that they need in order to do safety planning, I believe. Um, and ideally coming to that realization herself rather than being told. But if she is told, if it's by a healthcare provider or the police or a domestic violence advocate, look, you're at high risk. You're at, if you do the weighted uh, um, scoring on the danger assessment, you're at extreme danger. Um, that this gives her a, a, um, a voice saying, and she may have suspected it all along. We have some quotes from, from some other women. One woman said, hey, this is no news flash. I knew he was scary. But this does give me some backing to push the system more. So then the, the safety planning you can do is based in part on how dangerous he is. Um, and then the, um, then it, the safety planning needs to be contextualized to her situation, to her culture, to other sources of discrimination and violence against her. Um, so that it's not just about her personal situation, so that it's also the context has to take into account. Um, and Diane Redsky was talking today about her program, the Spirit of Peace program, which I think is awesome, where she, um, and she can talk to you more about it if you're interested. Um, then we developed the My Plan app. Now, Nancy Glass, my colleague, my friend, uh, was the one that first developed the My Plan app, but the danger assessment is in it. And importantly, I don't know if this will work, yeah. So the danger assessment, the woman is asked, first of all, a little bit about her background. If she says she's in a relationship with another woman, and you know, there's problems in the relationship. There's some first identification that the relationship has issues. Um, the word violence is avoided at the beginning. Uh, let me back up a little bit. It can also be done by a family member or a friend. So if it's not by the woman herself and it identifies that at first, starts off with internet safety, app safety strategies, et cetera. There's a get out of this app and go to a planning your, I don't know what it is, your work life or something. Um, it goes straight to that if you want it to. Uh, so there, there is some safety strategies built into that app. You can see also see the little leaf that's on the front of it and it just says my plan. So it's not a very, it doesn't scream out abuse or circle of safety or anything like that. Um, and then it asks her what her priorities are in life. Are her priorities her children? Which, you know, every abused woman I've ever talked to that has children, you know, that's number one. But if she doesn't have children, then the safety planning that's offered is not about children. Um, and then after it goes, and it goes through some relationship myths and that, um, that's one of the things we're tailoring to indigenous women in our work with them, my plan. Uh, then it asks the questions that are on the danger assessment and it scores it for her. And you can see there, it um, gives where she is on the levels of danger. And we did some work with some women that said, you know, six months later they said, Oh, I was in the red zone. I remember that about that app. I don't remember anything else, but I do remember I was in the red zone. <laughs> you know, so, but, so it's a powerful um, message of where she is in terms of risk of homicide. Um, then it, it tailors, and it's brilliant programming. James Case is the person that programmed it. It tailors the safety strategies that are offered to her to those back, that background information, to her priorities, and to her level of danger. 
And so this does not take the place of domestic violence advocacy, but it's an extra tool that we can use for people that aren't ready to talk to you wonderful, fabulous, best people advocates. And that's always one of the choices that's given is in the United States, it's the National Domestic Violence um, uh, Hotline. Now this has been, there's a Canadian version called I Can that Marilyn Ford Gilbo has developed and they've done an, an evaluation of it. Uh, those results are in, it's not yet published and they're eventually planning to get it in the App Store also. Uh, the only one that's in the App Store now, both kinds of app stores is the My Plan. It's also iSafe in New Zealand, and the evaluation of iSafe in New Zealand was very effective for Maori women, even though it was not specifically tailored that way. So what we're doing now in the United States, we're trying to develop an indigenous version of My Plan. Um, I have a team of indigenous researchers that are in charge of it. Uh, we started out with in-depth interviews of service providers and abused indigenous women. It has, it's, it will have the DA circle in there for the danger assessment. Um, by the way, in my plan, if you say you're in a relationship with a, um, a, a, another woman, you get the DAR rather than the regular danger assessment. Um, we're um, tailoring the priorities, the myths, the safety planning strategies for indigenous women in the United States. We'll get to Canada one of these days. Um, and we're also doing the same thing with the same grant money from NIH, so we can't go global. But um, is, and we're calling it, by the way, our circle. You can see a pattern in these things. Um, and the immigrant version of my plan is, is going to be called We Women, and it's based on the danger assessment for immigrant women, doing the same kinds of cultural adaptation as for our circle. Um, like, for instance, in our, um, our circle, um, a lot of the safety planning strategies are reconnecting with your spiritual um, practices, your traditional practices, um, those kinds of things like what I've been hearing about today. I can, that team here in Canada, um, like I said, the, the findings are in press, and there's an I Heal um, online strategy that was also developed by Marilyn Ford Gilbo for healing after abuse. Um, and there's a team in uh, BC, Colleen Varco and her team in uh, working with Aboriginal women um, for healing after abuse. And I do believe healing from the trauma has to be part of safety planning strategies. That we have to pay attention to healing. And I think we have to pay attention to that in our prevention programs, our dating violence prevention programs. We have to pay attention to people's experiences of trauma, whether they're Aboriginal or immigrant coming from another land, et cetera. That has to be part of our, our safety planning strategies. And I finished on time. What do you think? Ani, bonjour, sego, segoli, skanagoa, bonjour, hello, good afternoon. Wabmimi dijnakas, we kwemkun dojaba. I'm truly honored to be here with you today. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the original indigenous inhabitants on whose territory we're gathered here today. When I started with the Native Women's Associations as a very young youth member, one of the original projects we did when we went out and asked around all of the kitchen tables to our members, what was the biggest barrier for you and your family, for you achieving the quality of life, the kind of life you dream for for your family? And eight out of 10 of those women said it was the violence. It was the violence in their homes, in their families, in their communities. Some communities, it was as high as 95%. How can we focus on getting a job when you have a black eye? How do your kids do their homework 
How do we do school projects when you're scared to go home at night? Yes, there's extremely high rates of violence in our communities. It's in fact the number one reason that our women leave our communities. It's not for education, it's not for employment, it's to escape the violence. And now you, people may look at First Nations and say, well, that's it's because of them. This is the legacy of colonization. Violence was not part of our communities. It was not part of our tradition. Sorry, I just realized we're still looking at hers. Patriarchy, violence, misogyny was imported with the explorers and the colonizers, the same as cholera, smallpox, and all the other diseases that have infected our communities. We had equality in our societies. Our women were strong. We had matrilocal, matrilineal, and even matriarchal communities. And that means, that's not to say that our communities were all happy, joy, and peaceful all the time. No, life was harsh. Everybody gets that. But our women had protective factors. When you were matrilocal, our women, the men joined the woman and her family. And if you were living in a wigwam in a village right next to her brothers and her uncles and her father, violence wasn't tolerated. In our communities, if a woman decided that her husband wasn't a good provider, if she decided that he was becoming violent, what she did was put his moccasins outside the door of that wigwam, and because the wigwam was the woman's property, he had to go home to his mother. That was his sign if he came home from trapping and his moccasins were out there. That was for him to go back to his mother and to his community. We had matriarchal communities where the women had decision-making power. They couldn't tell the men what to do, but because they controlled the fruits of their produce, they controlled the corn, they controlled the food stores for the winter, they couldn't tell the men not to go on a war party or a hunting party, but they could control how much food they took with them because those stores belonged to the women. So they could say, you can go anywhere you want, but I'm giving you a day and a half worth of food. And that's how we maintained. And in the fur trade, our women were important factors in the fur trade. Their role in preparing the hides meant that they were valuable. And at the end of the fur trade, and then came the British and the assimilation and the churches and the residential schools and trying to break that equality. Because strong, empowered, equal Indigenous women was a threat to patriarchy everywhere. When those colonizers came over with this myth that men are superior, and that the creator says that the man should be the head of the family and the women and children should be subservient. If you tell them that that is the natural law from God and then you come to a country where all of these women are running around as equals, that threatens your entire society. So of course they attacked our women. Of course it was a very deliberate program of trying to eliminate the power of our women. The Indian Act that said only men over the age of 21 could be on chief and council. The Indian Act that said an Indian was an Indian man, the wife of an Indian man, or the child of an Indian man, shows very clearly how that patriarchal, how that misogyny was brought and forced upon our people. And after generations of trying to impose that on our people, of course there's violence in our communities. But you look at the entire society, the attitudes about Indigenous women, when you have a society that has had generations of dehumanizing indigenous people, starting right with that church, the papal bull, the doctrine of discovery that said our people were not even human. And then when you mix that with a society and patriarchal that comes and that says that women are property, of course indigenous women become the lowest of the low in that structure. The most vulnerable. The prejudice and the stereotypes and the attitudes that come with it. Embodied. When my mother went to the Supreme Court because she lost her status, she lost her right to be an Indigenous woman, went all the way to the Supreme Court, and one of those Chief Justices said he couldn't understand what all the fuss was about because she had been declared no longer an Indian. He said, you would have to show that you lost something, that this was some hardship. And he said, we all know what it's like on an Indian reserve. You should be happy that a white man would marry you. You're better off. This is the kind of racism that our women face when we go to have safety plans and you go to police, you go to courts, that's the kind of attitudes our women face. So it's no wonder they don't report. It's no wonder they don't reach out for help because that's the kind of help we've got for generations. That racism and that prejudice and that's unfortunately very, very common attitudes. When we talk about our women being afraid to report, afraid to reach out for help, 
You have to remember the history of police forces in Canada. Police forces that were used to steal our children, to take them to the residential schools. Police forces that put our parents and our elders, our chiefs in jail when those parents refused to hand over the children to the residential schools. So of course our people are afraid to go to the police. But then when you add to that the situation in Valdor, the BC Commission of Inquiry, we see that this is not just a few bad apples. This is a legacy of police forces abusing Indigenous women in this country. An RCMP officer who arrested a young Indigenous woman, and when she was in the jail, he came back after, after hours in his plain clothes and said he wanted to take her out because he wanted to pursue a relationship with her. And his buddies, the other RCMP officers who should have been protecting her, they laughed and they goaded him on and they said, you arrested her, do whatever the, you want with her. And they let him take her. That's the kind of policing we get in some of our communities. That's the way Indigenous women are treated. They're picked up for hitchhiking and asked for sexual favours in order to be driven home by the police. So it's no wonder our women are afraid to reach out. This is a huge barrier. How, if the very people who are supposed to protect you are the ones who are abusing in our communities, how do we get help? The legacy of the 60s scoop, child welfare agencies who came in and just stole our children in front of the homes sold those children across to the U.S., five to $10,000 per Indigenous child. It's no wonder a woman doesn't report because she's afraid that if she reports, she's going to lose her children. They will go into the child welfare system, and they'll never be seen again. And it's a very legitimate fear in this country. So our women would rather endure the violence than lose their children. Many of our communities, how do we change this? Police forces that want to build trust, we have tribal police forces, which can be a challenge because in communities, if it's tribal police, everybody's related to everybody, then you have family pressures. People saying, look what you're doing to him because we're all in the same community and they see. Remote First Nation communities where you have policing by the Ontario Provincial Police. Some communities, they have two-week shifts. They have as many hundreds of different police officers through that community for two weeks at a time. How do you have any follow-up? How do you build any trust? How do you even know what goes on from one month to the next when the people are there for two weeks and then gone? There's no follow-up. There's no relationship building. The biggest challenge to safety plans in our communities is many people have never been to a First Nation. Many people in this room have no idea what it's like. When we started doing this work, in fact, you know, trying to advocate for shelters in our First Nation communities. I remember I was probably about 18, and I went to a local community, and the chief, he heard I was with the Native Women's Association, and he says, oh, I got a bone to pick with you. I thought, oh, Lord, here it comes, right? And he says, why are you always trying to force shelters down our throats? We don't need no shelters here. Our women were strong. Our women didn't leave. And he said, when I was growing up, yeah, my dad, if we stepped out of line, my dad took the strap to us. If my mom didn't listen, he'd slap her around. That's just part of being in a family. And I didn't know what to say, because how can you equate violence and assault with ketchup in the refrigerator? It's just something everybody has in your family. That's the unfortunate normalization of abuse after the breakdown because of the oppression, because of the residential schools, because of the 60s scoop. That's the tragic reality in many of our communities. And when we are trying, when we have shelters, you know that in Ontario, we now have 31 shelters on reserve. But if you stop and realize that there's 133 First Nations, that means there's over 100 First Nations where there's nowhere for our women to go. When we have rural communities, it doesn't matter if you have bus fare, there's no buses. It doesn't matter if you have money for a taxi, there's no taxis. We have a very closed system. In a First Nation is the only area where if you make a complaint, if you're in the city of London, that doesn't impact your housing, really. It wouldn't impact your job. It doesn't impact your children's schools. But in a First Nation, because everything runs through the band council, we had a woman make a complaint, and her partner, who she had put in jail, was actually on council. They made a band council resolution. She lost her home. She was forced to leave because they can do that. No other place in Canada can the local mayor and city council decide that you have to get out of your house because you've made a complaint against your husband. Nowhere. And this is, in fact, not even the remote communities. Some of our communities, we don't have roads, ice roads, or a plane ticket 
for $3,000 to get out. How can we escape when we're in those situations? I had a friend. She was way up north. And she was being abused. So she called us. We somehow managed to get a plane to go up there. They met us on the tarmac and turned us around. They said, go back where you, we don't need you here. So we couldn't get to her because they had every right on that First Nation to do that, to tell us we could not come on territory. So a month later, that woman put her baby on her back and walked 100 miles through the bush to escape. Nobody should ever have to be in that situation. And until in Canada and Ontario, we have effective transportation systems, we develop infrastructure, and we recognize that even in First Nations, our people deserve the same basic standard of living. The situation won't change. But that's why we're here today. Because people like you can make a difference. And on the day when you feel like you can't do this anymore, how many people here, hands up, how many people have those days where you decide, I'm not doing this anymore, I can't take it, I'm not going into work because I can't do another day? I have those days all the time. On those days when I think I want to go crawl under a rock where violence against Indigenous women doesn't exist, I'd probably have to elbow Stephen Harper to get out of the way under there. <laughs> Sorry. Those days, I had a day like that, and I was at a, the UN, and a woman from South America said, you know, you, you, have, you, you know about the power of the hummingbird? And I said, no. And she says, but it's on your skirt. And I said, well, I actually just like this skirt because it has a stretchy waistband, so it's really good for buffets. And when I travel a lot, you know, you need that. And she said, no, the power of the hummingbird, that there was a story among her people about when the forest fires were burning and all the animals were standing around wanting to do that, one little tiny hummingbird was whipping back and forth. One drop of water. He was flying to the river, picking up one drop of water and dropping it on the flames. And all the animals started laughing and saying, what do you think you're doing? He's got his little singed wings, and without missing a beat, he said, I'm doing the best that I can. And that one drop at a time, thousands and millions of drops together become a flood. They become a torrent that can put out the fires of racism and sexism and abuse and violence. And that's why one person, one drop at a time matters. And each and every one of you here is part of that solution that is going to eventually make the change so that we don't have these kind of conferences anymore, because you are the change. Thank you. Thank you, Kate, and uh, thank you, Peter and Myrna, for the opportunity to speak here today. It's an honor to be speaking to you today and in this place and with my uh, esteemed co-panelists. Okay, so in its second domestic homicide brief, the initiative said that those conducting risk assessments should use structured, reliable, validated, and defensible risk assessment tools or guidelines. So the initiative doesn't have a position on which approach or which tool to be using. Um, and you, at this conference, have been hearing about a number of tools that are structured, validated tools. And I'm going to be focusing on one approach, uh, the actuarial approach, and in particular on the Ontario Domestic Assault Risk Assessment, or which is an actuarial tool. So actuarial has to do with the statistical calculation of risk. It's an approach that's used in many fields, including the insurance industry and medical health, and as it turns out, in a violence uh, risk assessment as well. Uh, actuarial methods have to do with measuring uh, risks or potential risk factors at a given point in time and then following up uh, a sample or a group, in this case domestic uh, offenders, for example, following them up and measuring the outcome as well. So that every item that's on an actuarial tool is a risk factor that uh, has been shown to be measured at one time and related to an outcome at a later time. So this, um, an actuarial tool is scored. Each item on an actuarial tool has a score, and the total score um, is um, the uh, conclusion of the, the tool uh, to an extent, is the sum of all the item scores, and that sum relates to uh, an individual's estimated risk and also a rank order, so how an individual compares with other domestic offenders who have been assessed. <clears throat> 
So as I said, uh, actuarial tools are used in a variety of fields, including uh, medical risk assessment. And I was actually able to go online and evaluate my own risk of developing breast cancer. So this tool allowed me to enter my individual level, my own information, and it told me two things. One, it told me what my risk of developing breast cancer is in my lifetime, up to the age of 90, which might be a little optimistic. Um, but uh, secondly, it also told me how my risk compares to others based on uh, large studies. Um, so an actuarial tool can tell you both individual information to help you either communicate to uh, a victim that you're supporting or uh, help you make decisions about an individual perpetrator that um, uh, you may be treating or uh, deciding on a variety of different risk management strategies for. But it also helps at a more population level or policy level because uh, planning can be made for how many people you may expect to need certain resources for. And in particular, actuarial tools fit with the risk, need, and responsivity principles whereby we give the most risk management interventions or actions to those people who represent the highest risk of either perpetration or victimization. So the ODARA being an actuarial tool gives this kind of information. Um, it can be presented in a figure like this, so for people who are comfortable with reading figures or enjoy the statistics, um, this table, uh, this figure can tell us a number of things. First it tells us that with increasing ODARA scores along the bottom, you see increasing risk of domestic violence recidivism. Um, it also tells us that, um, shows that we have done a number of studies and found the same pattern, validating the ODARA in different studies. The line also shows the distribution or um, uh, a summary we can take from that is that at the extreme ends of risk we see relatively fewer perpetrators and this is based on research with um, male perpetrators of domestic violence. The results don't have to be displayed in a figure like this. They can also be summarized in a table that we would call an actuarial table. And here um, you would find the ODARA score uh, down the first column, and you can look over to see uh, an individual's estimated risk in the next column. And perhaps more importantly, the other columns also show where an individual stands with respect to others who have been assessed on the ODARA. It can also be communicated like this, uh, and this, these pie charts were suggested to us by nurses who were working with um, victims, female victims of domestic violence at Ontario's sexual assault and domestic violence treatment centers. They found this was a more um, user-friendly communication for their clients, but it still also shows the estimated risk in the shaded areas of the graph and where um, people stand with respect to each other by looking at the whole row, the whole column of the pie charts. It can also be expressed like this, which to me is quite user-friendly and very similar to um, what I received when I assessed my risk for developing breast cancer. So I've mentioned the ODARA. I haven't really talked about um, what the ODARA is other than an actuarial tool. Uh, this is a screenshot from ODARA 101, our online training for the tool. Um, and this is a piece that you would see after doing the learning modules and when you've uh, been through some practice videos and you get the opportunity to practice scoring um, the ODARA and each individual item. So the first few items have to do with the perpetrator's criminal history, such as prior domestic assault and a police or criminal record. Um, um, the three items after that have to do with things that occurred at the most recent domestic assault, like threats, confinement, the victim's concern about future assaults. And the remaining items have to do with aspects of the relationship and the circumstances, their children, any assaults during pregnancy, uh, barriers to accessing support, and so on. So that's just a brief summary of the ODARA. And now I would like to talk a little bit about choosing a risk assessment tool. Um, I have just picked out five different uh, principles in choosing a tool, and each agency or jurisdiction uh, needs to choose the tool or the approach that is right for them, that's going to be the most effective in supporting their risk management procedures. So validation refers to uh, whether a tool has been tested, especially in um, multiple studies, to make sure that the tool itself or the items on that tool or the uh, 
the summary statements from that tool are actually related to domestic violence recidivism in, in the case of the tools that we're talking about. And all the major tools that you're hearing about at this conference have been validated. I would include in validation inter-rater reliability or agreement, that is, if I score the ODARA in a particular situation and Peter scores the ODARA in the same situation, do we come up with the same score? Because if we are scoring the ODARA differently, if it's a different score every time, then it can't be used in a valid way. Um, and we have done a number of studies on the ODARA finding that we have good agreement in that way. Generalization has to do with, okay, we've maybe validated the tool in one sort of population. Does it generalize to another population? So here's where we want to see studies done in different countries and so on, um, and, or, or in different settings, such as the victim advocacy setting or the police or correction setting. Um, Generalization also uh, for in domestic violence risk assessment, there is a big issue with uh, whether tools that are developed for male perpetrators with female victims will generalize to female perpetrators or to perpetrators, perpetrators and victims in a same-sex relationship. Um, we, we do have a number of studies now validating the ODARA for female perpetrators, and we want to see more happening in, in that direction. And we are hoping to see more work done, or at least some work done with the ODARA in same-sex relationship violence. Um, and that really is an area that is a current challenge for domestic violence risk assessment for all our tools. Information has to do with whether you have the information needed to complete the risk assessment tool or approach that you want to use. Uh, for example, the ODARA was developed for frontline use uh, with victims or in policing circumstances. Um, and uh, but we have a sister tool called the DVRAG that requires using uh, the psychopathy checklist, which is a restricted psychological tool that takes a lot of background information. So in, depending on your circumstance, you may not be able to use that tool. So that's part of that decision about the choice. Communication is another issue. Is this something, uh, a tool that's gonna help you communicate back to the people you serve, to, perhaps to share the information um, with uh, a victim who has given you her information? How do you share that back with her in terms of a risk assessment result? And does that help her um, make decisions about her own safety and move forward? Is this a tool that uh, police can use also to communicate with the courts or, that, or with um, probation and can shelter staff um, use this tool with their clients and then uh, communicate with their local policing services about the level of risk uh, in, in an individual case or in general in the community that they're serving? Um, and my final point is about education. So you've selected a tool, can you access the education that you might need? Is there education needed for this tool? Uh, is it accessible? Is it affordable? Is it uh, timely? Can you get uh, your, if you have a, a crew of staff you want trained, can you uh, make sure that your training needs are met? So I've said a little bit about Adora 101. I'm not going to say any more at this point, uh, but we do have a showcase out there in the break if you want to come see me there. So just in summarizing about uh, risk management and safety planning, I think both of these processes consist of all the decisions that we make, whether it's about um, a perpetrator, we need to decide uh, what's going to happen, or uh, in a victim's case, if um, they're deciding, uh, making a number of decisions for their own safety. Uh, we make decisions with relation to risk management and safety planning all the time. And it's always with some notion of risk in mind, whether it's a gut reaction, a gut sense of what this perpetrator might be capable of, or whether it's a structured, validated, uh, scored tool, or however it may be. If we're using structured, validated tools, we can increase the effectiveness of our risk management and safety planning. Actuarial tools especially are designed to work with the principles of effective intervention so that we can be doing the most intensive, uh, the most extensive, the broadest risk management for perpetrators who represent the highest risk. And we can be planning for this at a policy level as well.
Okay, well, then, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> and uh, I will hand over to our next speaker. Thank you. It's uh, a pleasure to be here to talk uh, about uh, this challenging topic. So uh, we had talked about uh, how to make this sort of the most practically useful talk, and uh, well, at least I talked about this with Peter. Um, and uh, we thought talking about this issue of linking intimate partner violence uh, risk assessment to risk management is a very important one because uh, it's always been our philosophy that uh, risk assessment is nothing without good risk management uh, plans. Risk assessment is nothing if it can't inform us about actually what to do with the case. Um, uh, and so, but before I get into that, um, I think I've got a. I had to put this in here because uh, I'm, I, when I was putting these slides together, my daughter emailed me this picture. This is the puppy that um, she's finally getting after asking for a puppy for five years. So I thought it can't hurt to show a puppy at a conference like this. Yesterday was really heavy, so. Um, I'm pretty excited to meet uh, this little girl. So, uh, so we've, uh, I learned the hard way when I first started doing threat assessments. Uh, I can remember I was doing a dangerous offender assessment. I went through and I thought I was pretty smart and I went through and I used all the available tools. It was a sex offender who had also had a history of domestic violence. And uh, I, get, I did my risk assessment, I sent it into the court, and I got a polite response. Thank you very much, Dr. Kropp, but could you provide us with some uh, useful information? And I thought, well, uh, and I almost retired at that point. But uh, the, the response was, can, can you actually tell us what to do with this case? Because what we're struggling with here in court is, uh, can we manage this person in the community? If we place him in the community, how can we prevent him from reoffending? So that actually, that experience and others uh, really influenced our approach to developing risk assessment measures. And the whole idea would be, can we develop something like the SARA, which was the Spousal Assault Risk Assessment Guide, was the first tool we developed. There's sort of a one-stop shop, one shopping where we can actually guide people through the entire process of risk assessment and uh, to the point where they're making good risk management plans. So it's a process that we're actually trying with the tools that I've been involved in developing that we're trying to actually help people through. We think people, you know, regardless of where you're working, whether it's victims, offenders, uh, you are doing risk assessments, threat assessments anyways, um, whether you're using a tool or not. Uh, we wanted to, to basically guide you through that process in the most structured way possible. So there's sort of four general principles or steps that you know, I would suggest are important. The first is to identify risk factors, then to think about the actual relevance of those risk factors, to think about risk scenarios, and then build management plans on top of those scenarios. So let me just walk through this. So when we're thinking about identifying risk factors, we'll have, you've seen lots of risk tools and you know there's lots of these lists of risk factors and I echo uh, uh, Zoe's thoughts about this. We have to focus on risk factors that have some empirical relevance uh, in the literature whenever possible. So we want risk factors that have been validated in the literature and uh, show some predictive accuracy. Um, our approach is a little different in that we would also want to include risk factors that we believe might be difficult to empirically validate, but might have some professional um, and practical utility in the, in the sense that, that the professional consensus out there is that you know, there are some risk factors um, that are important to consider that may be difficult or rare or hard to validate. Uh, and then there's the whole legal question about using risk factors that are fair, uh, that um, don't discriminate, they don't use ascribed characteristics of individuals. So, you know, we can't talk about skin color even if there was, uh, you know, an empirical association between skin color and violent behavior. It's unhelpful to, to do that, it's discriminatory, um, and it's not actually addressing what the underlying risk is. So. Uh, risk factors need to be fair and reasonable. 
um, you'll see, uh, you know, uh, I agree with uh, Zoe that we have to use structure. Uh, if, we, if we do threat assessments without any structure, uh, we do not get reliable risk assessments. It's as simple as that, and the literature and the research is pretty clear about that. Uh, Risk assessments need to be contextual, so we need to uh, uh, always think about the individual case that we're assessing uh, and think about the context in which that violence is occurring in that family. Uh, so we believe in thinking about static and dynamic and flexible risk factors in the assessment. So this is just the be safer. So this is an example of the structured professional judgment approach to risk assessment. Uh, some of you will be familiar with the Be Safer. It was like our uh, shortened version of the SARA. Uh, so you can see we have risk factors related to the violence itself. So we think about violent acts, threats, escalation of that violence, violation of court orders, and attitudes that support or condone violence. We think about the uh, psychosocial adjustment of the perpetrator. So think about general criminal attitudes, behaviors, in intimate relationship problems, substance use pro problems, excuse me, mental health problems and so forth. And then finally, victim vulnerability factors. Um, attitudes and behaviors of the victim, uh, and, and this is not, of course, to hold victims responsible for the violence that's being perpetrated against them, but it's understanding the vulnerabilities and barriers. So uh, fear, support networks, living situation, health problems, and so forth. So a lot of you work with victims. This is basically the, the stuff of a good safety plan. This is important because, again, we're going to see that risk management, as, as I define it, will include um, victim safety planning. Um, we can't do risk management of the offender without considering victim safety planning with the victim. It's two sides of the same coin. So the next thing is, things. well, risk factor can be there historically, but is it actually relevant? I mean, we can go through a list of risk factors and, and check off a number of factors, but we don't actually think they're relevant right now to the risk that this person poses. So we ask people to think about, does the risk factor actually have some kind of causal relationship to this person's violence? And I'm talking about this later this afternoon in more detail, but you know, we can think about relevance in a number of different ways, but we think about, does it motivate the person to be violent? You know, is he motivated by revenge, or is he motivated by power and control, or is he motivated uh, <coughs> by um, uh, proximity to the victim, affiliation? There's a number of different reasons why men uh, are violent, and women. Uh, the other thing, the other way a risk factor can be relevant is actually just going to complicate management for us. So it's going to make us it difficult to implement good uh, management uh, strategies. So a risk factor can, you know, we, we take a decision-making model with risk assessment and we think that violence is a decision. Uh, and what we want to try to understand is why is this perpetrator deciding to behave this way? Uh, so we want to try to, in a way, get into uh, his head and think about what's he trying to accomplish, what might be disinhibiting him, so preventing him from appreciating the consequences of the behavior, both to himself and to the victim, and then what factors might be destabilizing him, screwing up his thinking, just um, affecting his ability to make good decisions. And it's risk factors that are impinging on the decisions, and that's, that's how we decide which risk factors we want to really focus on. This isn't as difficult to do as you might uh, expect if we actually um, uh, put in some structure to the process. The next stage we would talk about is developing scenarios. Now, uh, this again is a process where we want people to step back and think about what bad things are we worried about here. Now, this is something that we do naturally anyways. I mean, anyone that works with victims or offenders has those sleepless nights. You're thinking, what? is going to happen tomorrow. Is that guy going to do it? Is he going to kill her? Is he going to uh, abduct her and the children? Um, we are running these scenarios, usually very bad scenarios, uh, through our heads. 
all the time. And that's how we think we build good plans. We can't build plan, we can't build management strategies without having a good plan and without understanding what it is we're worried about that the perpetrator is going to do. So we have to think about what that person's done in the past. So we look at all the past and previous patterns of their violence, and that's going to tell us a lot. We also want to consider any development of new patterns of behavior or evolution of IPV. And we can do this kind of by considering a number of different scenarios. So the easiest one for us to think about always is the repeat scenario. We can think about, uh, uh, what, you know, is it likely that this person just going to continue doing what he's always been doing, the same sort of simple uh, pathway. Now that, the problem with only considering that is that offenders are creative. They can change. They evolve. So uh, we have to not just assume that violence is always going to be the same. Uh, a, a threat assessment has to consider a twist, a possible change in the motivation, uh, the victims, we know that there are possible multiple victims of violence, not just the, maybe the obvious person, but it might be the new boyfriend, the children, the mother-in-law, and so forth. Um, are the behaviors going to change? So thinking outside the box, that's how we prepare ourselves. This is, what, this is how people do this in emergency planning. We have to think what, you know, if an earthquake were to hit Vancouver, that's my hometown, um, tomorrow, are we prepared? We do that by trying to imagine all the different possible outcomes. The one we're always concerned about, and it's relevant to this conference, is lethality or worst case scenario, and I'm going to be talking about that in some detail this afternoon. We always want to ask that question. Is this going to escalate to lethal violence? And if it is, how does that unfold? What is going to have to happen for that to take place? We can do that. Now we start to, to get somewhere. We're just thinking about what warning signs we're going to be looking for. We, of course, want to imagine an improvement scenario. Sadly, um, those aren't always uh, very common. So always consider in our scenarios the nature, severity of the violence, the imminence of the violence, the likelihood, and as I said just a minute ago, Think outside the box on the victims, because again, it's, uh, we can have multiple possible victims. We can even have multiple perpetrators, right? So if we think that uh, in extended family violence, sometimes we call this honor, so-called honor-based violence, or, or, or uh, in a scenario of that nature, we might have multiple perpetrators and multiple victims. So it can get actually complicated, the, the, the notion that intimate partner violence is always one perpetrator, one victim, um, in my experience, and, and I think um, yours as well, um, is uh, not typically the case. We often have uh, many people we're concerned about. So the last step then, you know, in our process, and this is what we have, want to train people to think about, is how do we then link the risk management plans uh, to, uh, to our scenarios, to our identified risk factors. So we're going to target the relevant risk factors. Uh, you know, if, if it's substance abuse, we're going to try to make some recommendations about how to manage that. If, uh, if it's an uh, issue about static security for the victim, uh, security around her home or workplace, we're going to try to ad uh, address that. Uh, we want to specify, specific, uh, be as specific as possible as we can, uh, tailor our plans to individual cases. Every case is different. Uh, the strategies, I can't say the word strategies at 8.30 in the morning, um, but uh, they should be feasible, practical, and contextual. So you can go through a laundry list of, and ask for the world in your uh, risk, assess, risk management uh, recommendations and say, you know, you should be getting this world-class treatment and she should be getting all these support. But if we don't have the resources, it's really kind of a useless recommendation to make. So we always ask you to think, you know, let's, let's stick to reality. Let's make recommendations that are actually practical and useful.
And the, the last uh, point here is that you know, whenever possible, we should be linking a risk management strategy to uh, an individual or agency. So somebody has to own it. Somebody has to take ownership for the intervention. Or again, it's kind of useless. It, the reports will just drift. Nobody will read them. So who's responsible for what? Um, and a multi-agency approach, I think, is, is the way to go. I mentioned in the ICAT uh, teams here, uh, just it's the, it's the uh, multi-agency approach that I know the best uh, that's used in a lot of communities in BC. Um, Debbie Hamilton, who uh, was instrumental in developing these things, we worked together. Um, and uh, I think that kind of approach where everybody can, if you can get through the information sharing protocols and sit together and identify the high risk cases and work together, identify who's doing what, that's, that's the way to go. I understand it's not always practical, uh, but uh, uh, that's what I would recommend. Um, we have to be aspirational here, try to get to the point where we can do that. Uh, but it, I understand it's not always practical. So the strategies, I, I, I'm running out, I've run out of time, but the strategies that uh, we would say, this is a, a risk management plan. If we can't address these four areas, we haven't actually got a risk management plan in place. We have to think about monitoring strategies, very active monitoring, um, supervision, what controls, restrictions are we gonna place on that perpetrator, what treatment or rehabilitation uh, recommendations we're going to make for the perpetrator and how are we going to enhance the victim's safety. Not any one person or agency can do all this. That's why the multi-agency approach is really important. Uh, agencies need to communicate about what they're doing uh, and uh, I honestly believe that's the, uh, the best way we can go with this. Um, so we, I'm really blowing it, I'm sorry, but we actually have um, direct prompts, questions to ask about those four areas um, and uh, to remind people what the goal is, what the ultimate task is, and that is risk management. We should really just call it risk management. I think that's a better term for what we're trying to do here. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to, first of all, introduce you in my traditional name. And my name is Nibinka Bimusat, and that is from the Anishinaabe people from the Treaty 4 area. And my colonized name is Josie Nipanak, Executive Director for the Awudan Healing Lodge Society in Calgary. Can we bring up? So I've put up this picture, first of all, to acknowledge <clears throat> the unceded traditional territory of this area. And that is the Chippewas of the Tams, Oneida Nation, part of the Haudenosaunee people, the Muncie, Delaware Nation. Thank you, as I am a visitor on your territory today. Miigwech. I'd like to tell you a bit about Awatan Healing Lodge Society. We are a, an emergency women's shelter based in Calgary, Alberta. And uh, we've been in operation since 1992. And our clients are primarily Indigenous women, immigrant women, and settled Canadians or non-Indigenous women. At the, at the lodge, we use a, a healing lodge model as opposed to the crisis model. So we are based on a trauma-informed model. Strength-based, as well as a family-based model. Our vision is nurturing families living in peace. And all of the families who come to Awadan Healing Lodge come in with severe, uh, family violence, uh, domestic violence situations. And part of our role as staff, frontline workers, administration, is to ensure that we provide the best possible 
experience uh, of healing for those families when they come into the shelter, which means that everyone who comes and becomes part of the Awatan family, and they also, the children become part of the, uh, we become aunties, grandmothers to all the children, and we believe that every child who comes in should be loved and nurtured and hugged and, and given that, um, uh, that, uh, that sense of safety that is so often required. So I'd like to show you uh, three, three slides actually, which uh, how we do danger assessment for the past 10 years at, at Awatan, and um, it is the danger assessment that's been developed by Dr. Jacqueline Campbell. And this uh, danger assessment is uh, widely used by the shelters in the, in the province of Alberta. And so uh, we were curious about how uh, we found that uh, Indigenous women were, were scoring lower than uh, many of, uh, 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 as opposed to our non-Indigenous sisters. And, and um, we also found the same for, for immigrant women. And we found that our non-Indigenous sisters were scoring much higher uh, with the danger assessment scale, and Indigenous women were scoring 32% uh, less than the, um, our non-Indigenous sisters, and, and which kind of led us to, okay, so what's happening? What, what do we need to be aware of? What are the considerations that we should be bringing forth to, uh, um, to make or create a safer, um, uh, environment uh, to to have folks recognize the level of danger uh, that comes forth, uh, and here is the scale that we use. So we found that Indigenous and and immigrant women scored you know fairly fairly um, um, same. Uh, Non-Indigenous women scored much higher at 67 percent. So what are the risk factors? And I'd like to talk about some of those now and uh, points to consider around that, as well as when we develop risk factors, is to consider intergenerational trauma. And in this case, go back, uh, I'm going to give you a, a definition of, of, um, of trauma uh, as developed by Dr. Maria Brave Horse Yellowheart, uh, Yellow Horse Brave Heart, sorry. Cumulative emotional and psychological wounding across generations, including the lifespan, which emanates from massive group trauma. By this, we mean uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, colonization in Canada, racist policy to kill the, the, the child, kill the Indian in the child, loss of language, loss of ceremony, loss of culture. And this happened through the residential school experience. I was one of those kids that went to the residential school so I'm often asked, how often, how long have you been involved in the field of, which I prefer to call family violence? And I say, well, since I was five years old. Because at five years old, I went into the residential school, and that was my first experience with violence. Violence against children. And so that has become part of my history, part of my, my frame, and part of my thinking, and part of what safety means for Indigenous people. Cultural safety. We also had the 60 scoop which was involved. We now have child welfare and the highest apprehension rates in Canada. We have colonial policy, such as the Indian Act. And the Indian Act will determine who you are as, as an indigenous person, and it will determine at points where you get buried in this country. Property rights. We also, um, I need to go back. Okay, we look at uh, inter intergenerational disadvantage as well. Generations of children, families who attended the residential school, that blood memories passed down, health disparities, long-term separation from families, for example, the 60 scoop, where indigenous children were illegally apprehended from their homes and, and sometimes sold to, um, to different countries in the world. <clears throat> 
We have intergenerational poverty, social inclusion, exclusion rather, sorry, and that uh, was uh, where we were often placed on isolated uh, and remote uh, lands which are called reserves in Canada. And racism. We also have contemporary disadvantages. Again, I go back to racism. We know that in Canada that uh, um, Indigenous people rate the second highest in terms of racism in this country. 63% of community, 63 communities in this, First Nations communities in this country are without safe drinking water. <clears throat> Generations, one or two generations have grown up without ever knowing what safe drinking water is. Children are still leaving the safety of their homes to attend schools because we don't have schools. Or, uh, for, I had to leave uh, my home when I, at, um, at grade seven to enter into another residential school to continue on with high school. <clears throat> Child welfare continues to be the next residential school. Unresolved grief and trauma. Sig significant loss of loved ones. Missing and murdered indigenous women. More than 1,200 in Canada. That, and that's what the public record tells us. Many of us know who work the front lines that there are more than three thousand women missing in this country. We have been made disposable. We have been dehumanized. I want to tell you about Cindy Gladue, a 34-year-old Cree woman from Alberta who was killed and her body parts bought into the courts in Alberta. I'm going to read you this little quote from Dr. Julie Kay, who is part of the um, Institute for the Advancement of Aboriginal Women, who, um, um, who, who assisted us with uh, the intervener status that we were able to, to, uh, uh, to be provided with for the courts. And all of this relates back to safety for, uh, and, and risk assessment or danger assessment for, for Indigenous women, because these are our experiences, they're part of who we are. It's, it's uh, uh, and, and, and need to be considered. I'm read you this quote regarding uh, Cindy Gladue. The justice system responded to her assault with its own measure of violence in an act of complete and unprecedented dehumanization. Her sexual organs, human remains, were brought into the court covered in a paper towel. The court referred to this portion of her body as a specimen, a portion of a woman's body, a sacred, life-giving body that was paraded through the Canadian criminal court system, the very system that dispossessed Indigenous women from their land and that continues to criminalize their lives at staggering and ever-increasing rates. That was about Cindy Gladue, and, and so what happened with that is uh, through, um, um, the, we, the, appeal, the appeal has gone through, so the man who killed her will, uh, will once again go for trial. Tell you about Angela Cardinal out of Edmonton, who is a victim of sexual assault. And for some reason the, or another, uh, the, the judge ordered that she go to prison as well. But she was in the same, uh, um, or close proximity to the same cell as the man who assaulted her, where she could actually see him. And not only that, but when they were taken to court, uh, she was put in the same van to ride with this man who assaulted her. I want to tell you about Barbara Kettner, First Nations woman, 34 years old, Thunder Bay, Ontario, 
in January of 2017, she was walking down the street and a trailer hitch was thrown at her, hitting her in the abdomen. And uh, there was a car, carload of uh, three young men and uh, one of the men threw it uh, at a fairly high speed, threw out the trailer hitch to her and, and laughed and said, yeah, I got one. And uh, since then, uh, Barbara Kettner passed away on July 4th uh, of 2017 this year, and uh, we don't know yet whether or not this young man uh, will be charged. Uh, I think that's still pending some autopsy results. But uh, so that's uh, part of the experience uh, of, of, of Indigenous women uh, and the contemporary disadvantages uh, that we have. But, uh, having said that, uh, I'd like to as well build uh, and talk about the resiliency uh, that, that we have, is that we are very strong. We, we, we wish to be part of the research. We wish to be part of the, the, the policy making and to participate in a meaningful way, not as subjects of violence, but rather we want to be active agents in that work that, uh, that is conducted. Um, Talking with uh, my colleagues throughout the last few days uh, is uh, we need to have a danger assessment tool that is uh, specific to uh, to our experiences as well because our experiences uh, indigenous men often have those same experiences as well that need to be considered. Um, we need to build on community protocol, uh, indigenous healing models, uh, indigenous, uh, our elders need to be actively involved, um, our, um, our community leaders to be involved, and uh, indigenous women to lead. Um, these are, are, are very uncomfortable areas, but must be considered if we are to create safer communities. Um, I'd like to... Uh, one minute left, okay. I'm going to go to uh, Archibald, who's uh, from the Hamburg Regional Healing Foundation, who said that models, approaches, techniques, and initiatives that are based on Aboriginal experiences that feel right to survivors and their families, and that result in positive changes in people's lives. So models need to reflect who we are as Indigenous people. We need to see ourselves in that uh, uh, in, in, the, in the danger assessment models so that we can then take them back to our communities and manage that risk and that vulnerability in a way that we create safer communities and save lives. Thank you very much. As I said before, when I've been here in Canada, I barely got past the buttons on an elevator, so all these machines are, are quite the challenge for me. Thanks for inviting me very much indeed, I appreciate it. I want to just um, uh, talk about where we've been with fatality review. Um, I direct the National Domestic Violence Death Review Initiative in the United States and have been involved um, with work here with Peter in Canada and many other people, uh, folks in Portugal and uh, the UK and Australia and New Zealand as well. So. Um, I've been doing this for a while, and Peter gave me a chance to reflect on this. So um, I want to talk about where we've been, what the challenges are, and um, future directions maybe suggested by some of the work that we've done. So to put us all on the same page, we've got this operational definition of uh, domestic violence fatality review teams, or what we call um, in Canada homicide uh, review teams. And these teams are basically designed to identify um, those deaths caused by, related to, or somehow traceable to domestic violence. And they're also um, uh, designed to analyze those deaths um, quite meticulously and systematically um, with a view to developing preventive interventions. There's a lot of range, a lot of activities these teams do, there's tremendous variation, um, you know, so it's hard to encapsulate what we've done um, really over the last uh, 20 years or so. Um, the methodologies vary, teams vary in their resources. Um, sometimes we have um, uh, academics uh, involved in this work, um, some of whom uh, occasionally, like myself, suffer from academentia. So um, uh, when, when academics are involved, they'll tell you things like we have to produce scientific samples or representative samples or this or that. This is very difficult with this work because there's so much missing data. Um, there is a clear politic to case selection in some uh, jurisdictions in the United States. 
Um, there is also the threat, and I think it's um, a common threat, of trying to impose a grid of understanding uh, on the cases before we even start reviewing the cases. In other words, there's an attempt sometimes by some, whether they be of uh, this ilk or that ilk or this kind of methodologist or that, this kind of political persuasion or that, to explain the deaths in certain ways, in certain terms, and that too is problematic. It's right, putting the cart before the horse. So we've been there, we've been through some of those things. Um, there are clearly um, many problems obtaining information with the missing data issue. But there are also concerns around confidentiality and privacy and what we share. And our bottom line is that we want to do no harm. And, and that's a really important thing I think that we've learned. We've learned that team membership will be inclusive and creative. Um, bringing folks in from all walks of life who have been touched by these cases. Um, ideally, we have um, at our heart the study of ways of life, ways, ways people lived their lives. Particularly, we want to recreate the case through the eyes of the victim, ultimately the decedent, and others who were involved in the case. We want to involve family members, surviving family, community members, co-workers, friends, maybe even neighbor, neighbors or others. We also want to run our analyses, our reviews of these cases sometimes when we collect aggregate data through community groups, um, perhaps groups of battered women who understand what's going on in systems to run those recommendations by those folks. So we introduce over the years, and a number of review teams in the US have done this, sort of community feedback loops. So again, we've been there, we recognize the virtues of doing that as we work teams. It's very clear from both the research literature and the homicide review literature that intimate partner homicide is profoundly gendered. This is something that men mostly commit, direct that, beh that behavior at women. Um, there are cases, obviously, where women commit homicides. In many of those cases, women are prior victims of battering, but not always. But clearly, there are other trends here that we have to pay attention to. Um, actually, I'm sorry, what am I doing here? I'm supposed to be forwarding these things. Okay, you told me that wouldn't work, Peter, right? Okay, so, um, so this, this, the social patterning, this is an anecdotal observation from 20 years of work, but I think it's fair to say that roughly half these cases involve victims, decedents ultimately, who do not come to the attention of systems in general. In other words, they have no contact with agencies. Those folks die in isolation or relative isolation. And then there are probably another roughly half of the cases where victims have substantial contact with systems, but those systems had very little collaboration, communication, coordination of their activities regarding the case. And we've heard that here already at the conference today with some of the stories and the case histories. So it's very clear that we've got a lot of work to do in terms of missed opportunities. But we've at least established that there are those um, patterns. But these are stylized killings. We know this. There are patterns to them. There are antecedents. Some have framed these as risk markers. Um, but nevertheless, um, our risk literature in some ways parallels our fatality review literature. So when we read the reports and we read the risk literature, um, pioneers like Randy and Jackie have done this work, we do see similarities. And that, too, is encouraging, that sort of corroboration. Um, it's important, too, to face the fact that sometimes women kill men in situations where those women are aggressors, um, where they themselves may be um, batterers, where they themselves um, may have been subject to biographies of victimization in the past, just as male perpetrators themselves sometimes are. So these are important issues to bear in mind. Now, why isn't that going? There we go. There's Mark Twain. And this is a rather vulgar quote, but I like it. Most people, Mark Twain said, most people use statistics like a drunk man, and we should bold man, uses a lamppost more for support than illumination. Now, what did he mean by that? What do I use that for? The 
If we listen to the statisticians and the politicians, they'll tell us that over the last 20 or 30 years, the intimate partner homicide rate has declined. And that's true. These are eminently countable statistics because we often, not always because of the missing cases, we often are able to count relatively easily. So we might be misled by that graph into thinking that things are improving. They may be, but they may not be. The same we see here in Canada with the relative decline from 1993. I'm going to talk now a little bit about some general changes, if I can get this to line up. which I can't. Okay, there we go. So, some folks have looked very specifically at what death review teams have done and tried to track changes that have been introduced because of fatality review activities. Some research in Washington documented changes made um, in providing services for battered women, for example, with limited English proficiency because of some killings that occurred in that state. Likewise, police had introduced screening to um, detect suicidal abusers, knowing full well that if they're suicidal, there is a threat of homicide to those around them. There are other specific changes that we have listed up on our website, which is ndvfri.org, which you can see. There are various cards that people have produced to track offenders um, called the HOPE card, which is fairly well known in the United States. It's just a card with a coded message and order of protection that um, folks can carry around with them rather like a credit card. There are numerous systems changes that have been made. Um, as a result of fatality review. And again, if you go to our website, you read the reports, or you go to the Canadian website, you can see the kinds of changes that have been made. But it's very difficult for us to track those changes, and we'll see that when I talk about this a little bit later. So what challenges do we face? What can we take away from this work? Um, the, the first thing that we need to say is that Fatality review, homicide review is a methodology. It's a way of knowing. If we do it in conjunction with community work, then clearly we can build community, we can build intervention and coordination through the process of reviewing the case. So there is that organic activity of reviewing and coming together around an emotionally charged issue. But fatality review cannot clearly compensate for these various socio-historical horrors that we've been hearing about over the last couple of days. You know, there's no way that it can compensate for the horrors, the terrors of, for example, colonization of indigenous peoples, both here in the United States or indeed elsewhere. It's not going to um, be able to deal with issues related to the globalization of capitalism, automation, you know, the rise of bureaucracies, disenchanting bureaucracies. These are huge social changes that the review teams will perhaps detect in the work that they do, but can do directly little about. So there are limits to what review activity can do. And these things, these developments, these massive economic developments affect tax tax bases and they affect infrastructures. The way we organize economies, the way we tax and redistribute or maldistribute wealth, if you like, are critically important for battered women and their families. Those are conscious political choices. And again, teams reflecting on those and informing those decisions might be useful, but to date, teams haven't been able to see those as anything other than challenges. Now, when we look at trends in the United States, it's very clear that the steepest declines have been in marginalized communities, particularly in the inner city. African-American males have been the principal beneficiaries, along with, to a lesser extent, African-American females, in terms of the lowering of the homicide rates. But we also need to factor in medical advances, changes in emergency medical services, and I'm gonna get there in just a moment. <clears throat> 
it's very clear that the development of community policing brought emergency services, emergency medical services, to the inner city in the United States in a much faster way. We think that's lowered the death rate significantly at the same time as perhaps um, creating higher rates of aggravated assault. That's what the data seems to suggest. Now, some research has shown that without those rapid medical interventions, and the research of Harris et al. published in 02 originally addresses this, we need more research. It's very clear that the 15 to 20,000 homicides in the US in general, not intimate partner homicides, but homicides, would have been 45 to 70,000 without those medical interventions. And Harris et al. reckoned that about two and a half to four and a half percent um, improvement in the homicide rate or artificial lowering of the homicide rate occurs every year because of the rise of things like trauma centers and these effects. So we've got better at saving lives. We haven't necessarily become more peaceful or pacified or self-controlled. The CDC data in the US supports this. We know this is a major challenge. If you look at the CDC data from 2001 through 2011, it's clear that roughly those, um, those people wounded seriously enough by gunshots to require either a hospital stay, some kind of a hospital stay as opposed to treatment or release, rose almost by half over that decade. So these are cautionary notes for us. And when we look at the British research, Sylvia Wolby's research, which we need to replicate in um, other uh, democratic societies that have um, the statistical capacity to do this, it's clear from Wolby's research, which was published in the British Journal of Crim in 2015, that the practice of capping multiple assaults, and the Brits cap them at five, in other words, you don't count over five, when you, when you actually count the real number of assaults, violence against women in the UK has actually increased significantly since the 08 recession. And we see the same thing in the United States, even with the familicides. So these are causes for concern too. These are challenges. Other challenges that we have are clearly related to the outcomes, potential outcomes of fatality review work. We don't know the effect of review work. What we need is to know, I think, about at least 10 things and maybe more. We need to know how review team recommendations are implemented, how that gets done, what the machinery of implementation is, what effect that has and whether that's contributed to by other social change agents as well. We need to document changes in law and law-like systems, systems of rules. We need to document team expansion. We need to document public education and awareness and track this concerning domestic violence. We need to measure the more ethereal things that are more difficult to track, things like shifts in what I call the three C's, communication, coordination, collaboration of resources. Working together seems to hold out a lot of hope, and I'll address that when I conclude, perhaps more hopefully. Um, we need to get this sense of how fatality review or other C coordinated community responses change the level of integration and the focus, the train of the gaze of the state on these um, uh, disturbing cases. We also need to track rates of IPV, IPH, and other DV-related deaths, including the suicides. I mean, we suspect that um, we lose more women, better women to suicide a year exiting violent relationships than we do to homicide. And this is a reality. We need to get to grips with that. So we need to track those changes, bearing in mind, too, controlling for the impact of medical interventions. Um, I think, too, we need to look at the way resource mobilization occurs, and this, too, is a challenge. How do we garner more resources to do the vital work that we need? We've heard a lot about um, the deprivation um, of uh, resources, the dearth of resources in Aboriginal and remote and rural communities in this conference. We need to focus more carefully on that and how we can use reviews to um, argue for, cogently argue for more resources.
more difficult to document, but nevertheless important to document, are things like attitudinal shifts and even actual behavioral changes in relationships that may reflect um, changes in people's behavior, the way that, you know, the, way the system has worked uh, to encourage different forms of intimacy. And then we obviously also need to look at fatality review teams' links to government and the machinery of changing things at legislative levels. And then finally, I think, exploring the links between fatality review and risk assessment and how they comport with each other or don't and some of the issues related to risk assessment. So I'd like to say also now a few words about um, future directions. And I'm going to focus on four things. I'm going to focus on new questions or issues, surviving children, working with perpetrators, and the virtues of working together. And I'm actually wrestling with three screens here because I'm getting a pop-up menu here as well. So I want you to know how sophisticated this actually is, um, if I may be so bold. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. I'm now wrestling with a fourth um, form of interference. Thank you, Marcy. Um, <laughs> So, uh, questions that come up all the time. I, I review cases frequently. I go to communities. I still serve on the uh, Indian Country Review team up in Montana. I've been a, a member since we formed that team. Um, why doesn't he leave? What about the emotional condition of perpetrators? What about problematic notions of control? The notion of control is problematic. I don't care for the concept, I have to say, of coercive control, because to me it implies control is realized. And I've quizzed Evan Stark on this, and he still won't answer my question. But basically, to imply that women are totally controlled is to fly in the face of the resistive maneuverability of women that we see all the time in death reviews, right to the end, that desire to survive and to work things through for them and their kids. So these are complicated questions. Um, we, we have to deal with the shame and humiliated fury of perpetrators and the links between that and power and control. No one's saying that these men don't feel powerful or entitled or privileged, but they also are deeply humiliated often. Large numbers of intimate terrorists are deeply humiliated by who they are as men. And we have to begin to wrestle with some of these issues. Um, you know, people tell us that anger management and anger is less important and peripheral or derivative of the power and control dynamic. Um, my, under, my read of these cases is that anger is central um, as an emotion and that as an articulated behavior related to that, the aggressiveness that goes with um, uncontrolled anger is also important. We have somehow to think about those things. Um, we have to challenge issues about it. women's syndrome, cycles of violence, learned helplessness, the stock scripts that don't recognize the complexity in bad women's lives, decedents' lives, even men's lives who um, die in these cases. It's more complicated than that. We deal with issues of mental illness, with drug abuse. Um, these are very difficult issues to weave into the fabric of a simplistic power and control wheel. It's too crude and it's too inflexible. I now want to move on and say a few words about kids. Three or 4,000 kids a year in the United States are orphaned in these cases. Many of those kids see the deaths, clean up the blood, deal with the crime scenes. Fatality review teams know that those kids exist. We've known that for 20 years. But systematically, it's not been their job to address this. So in Arizona, one thing we did this year well, uh, not this year, three years ago actually, and Peter's been involved in this, um, is to launch our Arizona Child and Adolescent Survivor Initiative, where we are now providing wraparound services, um, intensive grief counseling for the complex issues the kids deal with, um, uh, mentorship programs, material support, victims of crime act support, legal support, um, estate planning support, etc., and plus peer support groups for those kids. We're now serving 70 children in the state of Arizona and roughly 70 new caregivers who've assumed the responsibilities of working with those children, caring for those children. And we have a number of other states in the US that are interested in doing this. We would love to set up a national initiative to do this. It's very important work. This is one of the things, one of the challenges I think that we face. Those kids, as you know, um, experience um, complicated trauma. Um, 
they have many, many uh, aspects to their life from nightmares, flashbacks, headaches, etc., etc. So these are, these are the things we're dealing with with the kids, tense feelings of shame, suicidality, etc. We have to deal with perpetrators. Perpetrators suffer a lot of trauma in their lives. We need to interview perpetrators when we do death reviews, and we need to realize, as James uh, Gilligan, James Garbarino point out in their wonderful work, that these guys experience trauma too. We wanna to focus on trauma, we gotta focus on perpetrators and work with them, bearing in mind that some of them claim amnesia and some of them genuinely suffer from dissociative amnesia. And I will talk too about, um, at other times, uh, men I've interviewed over the years. I've only interviewed probably 40 or 50 people who've killed in prison, and I have to say, um, I see that commonly. It's very sad. Um, so let's, let's, let's get to the positive now that Peter asked me to address. Um, first of all, um, when, you go to the, uh, when you go in for a medical procedure, they may tell you that you've got a 0.01 chance of some uh, negative outcome occurring. They won't tell you in the United States that a quarter of a million people die from preventable medical errors every year. They won't tell you that. Now, Randy showed a picture of his puppy today, so I had to show, um, I had to be contrary, and I wanted to show a radioactive wolf from the Chernobyl area, just to sort of play out the binary. So I'm a man of binaries too, I guess. You know, Chernobyl happened, and there's a thousand mile, square mile plus exclusion zone because the Soviets didn't talk with each other, they didn't work together. They knew for 20 years they had a lot of accidents, they didn't review them. There were mishaps, small errors build to large errors. So we've got errors in medicine, we've got errors in the nuclear fuel industry, and then we have aircraft crashes. Chesley Sullenberger landed that plane on the Hudson River eight years ago after he flew his plane into a flock of geese and he landed it successfully. And I found this lovely quote from him. I'm fighting with my pop-up menu again. But he said, you take a team of experts and you make them an expert team. That's why aviation safety is so, so much further advanced than that in medicine and nuclear power because they listen to each other. The pilot has an interest in doing that because they're gonna go down with the plane, I get that. The medical folks have problems with lawsuits, but the folks talk to each other in aviation, and if we can talk to each other doing fatality review, we can do something about these tragedies. I want to close, because Mars is gonna to get to me in just a second, there she goes again, another pop-up. I want to close with a quote from Adlai Stevenson, the U.S. ambassador to the U.N., and a tribute uh, to Eleanor Roosevelt after she died. I've lost more than a beloved friend. I've lost an inspiration. She would rather light a candle than curse the darkness, and her glow has warmed the world. So is it not possible that if we can do our review work well, with respect, through the complex lens of the lives of lost loved ones and in homage to them, that we can warm the world a little. Do we not owe victims at least that and indeed much, much more? Thank you. Oui, hello, bonjour. My name is Claudette Dumont-Smith, as you can see. Um, I'm from, I'm Algonquin from the Kitigan Zibi community in Quebec. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the Oneida Nation, the Chippewas of the Thames, and the Muncie, Delaware Nation for, on whose territory we are meeting today. Uh, I'd like to uh, begin my presentation with uh, this, this quote that I think is very uh, relevant. And I thought I could, I, I think I could see it. Violence in Aboriginal women's lives is pervasive and is compounded by violence and systemic and institutionalized racism, as well as the effects of historical violence, such as residential schools, the Indian Act, and other legacies of colonization. Violence in many Aboriginal women's lives is a daily occurrence for too many women have died er, either by murder or by their own hand. Many governments have been willing to fund studies and reports, but very few have been willing to set up and fund the long-term solutions 
to the problem of violence against our women and girls. <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, situate ourselves of what we speak about when we talk about the Aboriginal peoples in Canada. The Aboriginal peoples of, of Canada are comprised of three different groups, the First Nations, the Métis, and the Inuit. Um, and in totality, we make up about over 4% of the total Canadian population. The majority, 61%, are First Nations, 32% identify as Métis, and 4% identify as Inuit. We're a young population, more than a quarter, 28% are less than 14 years of age, and 18% are between the ages of 15 and 24. So if you do the math, um, the, our greater populations are less than uh, 24 years of age. Most of the First Nations live in Ontario and the Western provinces. There are about, this is important to keep in mind, there's about 600 First Nations communities in Canada, and there's over 60 languages, i.e. cultures as well. <clears throat> um, so, I'll just move on to the next slide. The majority of the population in Nunavut and the Northwest Territories are Aboriginal, so they're the majority there. And in the Yukon, they make up for uh, about one, uh, one quarter of that population. Nearly half of the First Nations live on reserve or in an Indian settlement, and the remainder live off reserve. Winnipeg, Edmonton, and Vancouver have the highest number of registered First Nations. We are the fastest growing segment of the Canadian population. In terms of just specific now to Aboriginal women in Canada, it's projected that our population will continue to increase to about 1 million to 1.3 million in about 17, 18 years. This, in the la in between the period of 2006 and 2011, the female population increased by 20%. Over one-third of the First Nations women live on reserve, so two-thirds live off reserve. Large concentrations of women and girls live in Winnipeg, Regina, and Saskatoon. And uh, the median age, again, is 29 years compared to 41 for the Canadian fe female population. I'm just going to take some water. <clears throat> Uh, women living on reserve in Inuit, women living in, in uh, Nunagat. Nunagat is comprised of four of the Inuit regions. The regions are located in Labrador, northern Quebec, northwest territories, and of course Nunavut. Um, in 2011, only half of the Aboriginal women between 20, 24 and 64 years of age had any post-secondary education. So, they do have lower uh, literacy and numeracy uh, skills compared to the non-Aboriginal women. Um, of course, they experience higher unemployment uh, rates. In 2010, uh, their medium income in, was f about 5,000 less than the non-Aboriginal, um, uh, than, Can um, than non-Aboriginal Canadian women. Uh, so, you know, they suffer from a low economic status. Many women and their children in Canada on and off reserve, Métis or Inuit, um, live in uh, poverty. So I'll just, um, the, I, no, the last uh, uh, bullet point on this is very important because 12% of First Nations women that are 25 years of age or older attended residential schools. And these, these are women in the childbearing uh, years. And then it increases as the women's, uh, as they age. So 28% of women over 65 attended residential schools and 21% of Inuit women over 25 also attended residential schools. So there's, uh, I think that's important to note because there, there is intergenerational impacts from being institutionalized in the residential schools. Um, in Canada, right now, right now today, Aboriginal women are seven to eight times more likely to be murdered than any other Canadian women in our, in our society. And a whopping one quarter percent Aboriginal women reported being victims of domestic violence. And when they do report violence, it's more likely to be se severe or uh, potentially life-threatening forms of violence like choking, use of gun, knife, or being sexually assaulted. 
I'm, I'm listing a whole bunch of challenges here that uh, Aboriginal women face, and when you're working with Aboriginal women, I think you have to take this into consideration. Um, they suffer from systemic racism, uh, ongoing effects of, coloni uh, of colonialism, the loss of culture and identity, inequities that exist, lower education uh, uh, attainment. A lot of them live in overcrowded and dwellings that are just they're just uh, substandard. Um, there's a lack of services for them, whether it be in the north, or remote, even in urban areas, there is a lack of culturally appropriate services, so they don't go out to seek help. There's misunderstanding by the health service providers, by the social service providers, by the police, and many, many reports detail all the challenges that the women face. Um, when women escape from violence and they move to urban centers for, for whatever reason, there's a lack of affordable housing. So what happens? You find a lot of Aboriginal women, most likely with two or three children in tow, living in uh, ghettoized sections of, of, of the cities. And, and you know, the children there are exposed to um, you know, unhealthy living environments. So the, the, that cycle of abuse that they left back home sort of is mirrored back in these ghettoized sections of the city. Uh, when they try to escape these northern or even semi-isolated communities, it, we heard that time and time again, it's, it's too costly, so they will tend to stay in these situations. And it's difficult to leave your community and your family support. And I think there's also a stigma and in speaking and, uh, and reporting uh, of violence in your community because everybody's rela related one, in one way or another. Um, I think though we live, I'm going to end up with a positive note because uh, I think that uh, two years ago the TRC, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, presented their report and there's 94 calls to action in there. And what I see, at least for, I live in a national capital region, is that a lot of national bodies like the Canadian Nurses Association, the Canadian Medical Association, the Society of Obstetrics and Gynecologists, the unions, and, uh, um, you know, teaching... Um, uh, teachers unions etc are looking at these TRC recommendations and they're implementing some actions in order to make the lives of indigenous people better and the, the lives of women um, you know will be improved if they touch upon child welfare because women won't report violence for fear that their children will be taken away. Education, with more education, that'll open a lot of doors in terms of increasing their economic stability. And of course, a return to language and culture is needed as well. I'll skip on to the other side, to the other one. Um, also, within the TRC report, of which anybody can download that from, from the internet, there's a whole section on how uh, Aboriginal, the Canadian society and Aboriginal people can reconcile and I think there's been a lot of uh, bad feelings, disconnection, disengagement, misunderstanding between the two uh, nations and I think we have to really uh, focus on reconciling with one, another, with one another and working on one another because the situation of violence against women the situation of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls is all over the world and it is a blemish on Canada and we're all Canadians. Um, okay, th these are just what is uh, under the reconciliation component of the TRC report. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch, if you're interested in the, you know, in improving or working with the Aboriginal women, um, I think there's a lot of exist existing resources that are posted on the website. These are just some that are found right across Canada. But I'd like to draw your attention that if I was a non-Aboriginal person, going to work in a, with Aboriginal uh, women. I think that, and I didn't know where to go and I wanted, you know, I wanted to know more inform information. For me, I would go to uh, the National Aboriginal Circle Against Family Violence, which is number 17 here. And they can advise you what shelters exist in your region and how to connect to that uh, shelter. Mind you, uh, this is negative as well. Uh, although there are 600 communities across Canada, there are only 38 uh, funded shelters, so there's, you know, that's a big lack uh, to address uh, women who are being abused. Um, I think 
uh, being here at this conference, what I see is that we need to develop an Aboriginal specific risk, risk assessment tool that's suited for First Nations, that's suited for Métis, and that's suited for the Inuit population. We can't just use, they are good tools, the Odara and the Sara, but I think we have to develop and use tools that are specific to that population. Uh, and uh, on, I, uh, services and uh, information has to be coordinated. It has to be a multidisciplinary holistic approach. It's not a feminist approach in, with the Aboriginal female population. You have to think of the whole family unit and the community uh, unit. All solutions must be tailored to the community needs. That goes without saying. And um, of course, the implementation of the TRC's calls to action. And the last thing I would like to say, and I don't think it's rocket science, we, because the rates of domestic deaths are so high, seven to eight times the rate, and violence is so much higher in the Aboriginal community, I think there is a need for an Aboriginal Domestic Violence Death Review Committee to review those deaths and to provide recommendations to decrease that number uh, in our Aboriginal population. And, you know, this is not pie in the sky idea. Such uh, uh, a review committee exists in Montana for the Native Americans. So I think we should demand that of our uh, Canadian government to do the same in our population. That's it. Thank you very much. Miigwech.